God was trying to bring these people into a realization where they were standing. Our maturing faith, is it increasing? Are we able to trust our God completely about whatever be the situation? That's the point here. We need to be sure that we recognize that God tests our faith. And again, I want to emphasize, we walk by faith, not by sight. A most wonderful and gracious God. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful time, for the fellowship you have given us. Thank you for your heavenly presence among us, Lord. Lord, you speak, we hear. Mold us in the way that your words that need to go into our hearts and minds, Lord, so that our attitudes and actions will always glorify you, Lord. Be with us throughout this message and let your name be glorified, Lord. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We will continue to focus on the grumblings of the Israelites in the wilderness. Last time, we saw a few points. We saw all the verses. We we'll still focus on the same three um, chapters of Exodus 15, 16, and 17. What we saw last time was like whenever we complain about our circumstances, we are denying God's protective care for us. And then when we complain, it becomes contagious to other people and other people start to complain too. And the third point, what we saw, when we complain, we undervalue the rich provisions of God. And what we saw was like the Israelites, they were complaining about do two things, <clears throat> what they had and what they did not have. This week, we will focus more on some of the principles I want to share with you that will help us walk forward in faith. Everybody have got a faith in some form or the other. But the question is, are we walking forward in faith? If there is any distress, any trials, any pressures that, <coughs> that comes into, is that shaking up our faith? or any other form of circumstances around us is shaking up our faith. We will look into the people of Israelites, how their faith was shaken and how they were in gratitude to God. We will look into that. Before we go into that, I want to give you more um, understanding of the geographical uh, situation that prevailed in that place. So you want to be a little bit careful by going through the scriptures and whatever I say here. Like when we see like the Israelites, they were in bondage in Egypt. And then they were released from their bondage by God and they crossed the Red Sea. And that was a huge miracle. They crossed the Red Sea and they enter into the wilderness or the desert of Shur, where they travel for three days, and then they become distressed because they could not find any water. Whatever they found was bitter water, so they grumbled. And from there, they moved into a place called Elim, which is an oasis, which had 12 springs and 70 palm trees. And they camped there. And from there, they moved into the Sin Desert or the wilderness, where they again complained about the food. So 
this is the overall picture we get from reading these three chapters from Red Sea to Shur Desert. They were without water and they grumbled and they go into Elim where they find 12 springs and they find like 70 palm trees, well replenished area. They camp there and from there they move to another desert where they again complain about food. So, <clears throat> and from there they move to another place called Rephidim. They camp there and where they encounter the Amalekites and from there they move to the Sinai Desert. So this is the overall geographical settings we would be looking into. The reason why I want to emphasize more on this is when you go through the first five books of the Bible, the whole geographical setting is occurring in the wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula over there. And one interesting thing that happens here, see like this, these people, <clears throat> they were in bondage in Egypt for more than 400 years. And after the 10 plagues, God brought them out of Egypt. <clears throat> so it took just one night for the Lord Almighty to bring these people out of Egypt. But it took him, the Lord, 40 years to get Egypt out of the people. That's the point here. We have to be very careful when we read this. This is not just a story we are reading. It brings more insight into our lives too. So the, here, the point here is the salvation. They were in bondage, they were in sin, and they were redeemed just overnight, one step. So that's the salvation. <clears throat> what follows salvation is sanctification. The sanctification is a process, is a daily process, is a moment by moment. We are being sanctified. The greatest mistake most of the people here as believers we make is once we are attain that salvation, once we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, that's it. The end point comes there. We think like everything is there. We have got into everything. We have got salvation and now we are ready to go to heaven. No. Salvation in Christ is a new birth. And that new birth must always give way to a healthy growth. That's what we see here in the wilderness. The wilderness narrative is all about the life of the Israelites. What we see there, we want to reflect those and examine ourselves where we stand in our faith journey. When we look into that, we need to also look how we were saved from our sins and how we were redeemed by our God, stepping out of that dark sin, and are we walking through our, towards that heavenly kingdom, removing all our sinful habits, trying to shed all our bad thinking or attitudes. That's what we want to see here. <clears throat> when we look into the wilderness story of the Israelites, these people were tested by God. When we read from chapters 15 to 17 of Exodus, these people, they were tested by God. And one another thing what we want to see here is, as they entered into the wilderness, they got a picture of themselves. And they were also able to see the picture of our Lord Almighty. In the wilderness, they had a lot of trials. But in that trial, 
are they holding ground of their faith? That's one main question we need to see. <coughs> Excuse me. When we read in James chapter 1, verse 3, we see like when we are tested of our faith, it produces patience and maturity. The progress only comes through the pain. The Israelites, they are going to learn that they cannot live a life on the backwards. Because if you see that in the Exodus 15, these people, they were much worried about their food, what they had in Egypt, which they are not having that in the wilderness. So these people, they were trying to live a life backwards. Though they had all the challenges and the trials in the wilderness, they had the thinking going back in their bondage life, like how they were replenished with the food they had. We need to understand that we cannot live in the past, nor can we live in the future, but we need to live in the present. It's one step at a time in faith. That's how we grow. So in today's message, I want to give you some few principles how we can walk forward in faith. <clears throat> the first one would be recognition. Recognize what? Recognize that God tests our faith. God calls us to walk in faith. We read in Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7 it says like we for we live by faith not by sight if you read into the exodus cha chapter 15 <clears throat> verse 25 <clears throat> even before that if you look into that they move into the desert of Shur, and they travel for three days, and they're not able to find water, and they start to grumble against Moses. So what happens here is, like if you read the verse 25, then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. So this is the first test God is putting these Israelites into. We need to stop here and analyze what this test is for. When we look into our lives, Everybody, like in the past, like we have gone through tests in our studies and in, in, in walk of way, like when we take a test, what does it show? Why do we take a test? It's not that we take a test that somebody who is giving the test should know where we are. It's not that one. We analyze ourselves to see where we stand. It exhibits our knowledge of a subject. Without a test, we would not be able to gauge where we stand. In the same way, <clears throat> God tests the Israelites, not for himself to learn, but make those people aware of where they stand. If you read in Deuteronomy 8, 2, 
<clears throat> chapter 8 and verse 2, Moses here says, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments. So that's, that's the principle. God leads these Israelites through the desert in order to strengthen the people's spiritual muscles by giving them various tests. And whenever these tests failed, they were immediately confronted with their sin and their unbelief. That's what we see. But still, in spite of all these things, God intervenes in behalf of those people by his grace. Though these people, they don't deserve anything, but still God brings them blessings. So what is the important truth here is God in his sovereign position redeems them in spite of their unbelief and ingratitude. God is able to show his grace to these people. <clears throat> and what, what one another thing what we find here is these people were tested for simple basic necessities in the wilderness, food and water. As I told you, like they moved from Red Sea to one desert after the another desert. But in spite of this happenings in between these places, they were always grumbling about their food and their water. Though it is a bare necessity, but still God wanted them to realize what is coming out of their hearts. You see, like the very first crisis in their journey started within like three days when they didn't have water, the drinking water, and they came to a place called Mara. They had their frustrations and they showed their anger and they desperately were like dehydrated. And what they saw was like salt water. They were not able to drink that salt water and they started grumbling. In the same manner, I think like God in our earthly experience, <clears throat> he purposefully tests us to see our faith. Are we really faithful to our almighty God? Thing like last time I was, when I was uh, taking this message, I was talking about <clears throat> five patterns, excitement, expectations, experience, exposure, and expression. The excitement of the Israelites as they were thrilled to go through the Red Sea on dry ground and they saw the miracle of God's hand. And they had a high expectation followed that once they moved out of the Red Sea, they thought like they were going to have a smooth sail to the Canaan the land that God had promised for them. And then what they experienced was a lot of problems when they were in the wilderness because like they had a lot of disappointments because of the food, because of the water. And then what happened is like instantly they were having their unbelieved heart being exposed. They're complaining and they're, com and they're grumbling. And what was their expression? They thought like God has totally disappointed them, left them all alone. So they did not have that demonstration of faith in them. <clears throat> so what we need to do here when we see these happenings, can we ourselves examine the same thing that is happening in our lives? When we were in dark places, when we were before redeemed, right? Even before our <clears throat> acceptance of Jesus Christ as our Savior. 
we had high expectation once we got hold of the salvation, right? Like a huge excitement in our heart. We have been saved. We are redeemed. You are highly excited. But what happens? Once we step into the faith journey, we had high expectations. We are thinking like we thought that this is going to be a easy job for us like we are redeemed now like god has accepted me and now like i'm going to heaven and now like everything is going to be so smooth but once when trials and tribulations and distress they come into our life slowly disappointment seeps into our hearts we then have an unbelieving heart and then we try to, when the pressure becomes more and more in some form or the other, we slowly start to grumble against God. If you could imagine this picture, our excitement when we were accepted and redeemed, and then like we were thinking like it's going to be an easy thing for me to go to heaven, like when there is going to be a second coming. And then like slowly God puts, puts us into testing. When our health fails, when there is an issue with our job, when there is an issue with the finances, slowly it is not going to change and we look into the picture and we get disappointed. We slowly start to grumble. <clears throat> it has happened to me in some form or the other. Every believer have gone through this. But I think like when we are obedient to God, and when we trust him, and when we obey him completely, surrender to him, read his words, meditate upon them, you don't stumble like this. You don't grumble like this. We have an intimate relationship with God. And then we focus more on heaven, not on circumstances. And this is the thing like I want to emphasize. Like we have this pattern. We have that pattern like the Israelites had. But we have to move forward in our faith journey. <clears throat> Look at the bitterness they had. Like when they saw the water that was bitter, the bitterness in their hearts were exhibited. It's not the outside element that was more important there like it was the bitterness of the heart that came out god was trying to bring these people into realization where they were standing our maturing faith is it in increasing are we able to trust our god completely about whatever be the situation that's the point here we need to be sure that we recognize that God tests our faith. And again, I want to emphasize, we walk by faith, not by sight. The second principle is realization. Realize what? Realize that God supplies our needs. If you turn to Philippians chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 19 and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus <clears throat> excuse me when the Israelites they set out from the oasis of Elim after some time, their stomach goes hungry. The hunger pains they had was testing their faith. That's the second test. That's the second test. If you look into the verses here, they start to grumble again. They start to grumble against God. 
the reason to themselves that things would have been better for them if they would have died in the land of Egypt, where they sat beside paths of meat and had plenty of bread. But you know what? These people totally forgot the fact that they were in bondage. They had a wishful eye towards the perceived pleasantries of the past, the forgetful nature, the forgetful nature. and the unbelieving people, they start to gum, complain and grumble. Are they taking their faith forward or backward? Their, their needs were legitimate, if you think about that, like they were, they were hungry. But what was exposed here was the spiritual condition. <clears throat> that's, that's, that's the reason we have to be very careful about our words, our actions, and our attitudes. These are our spiritual indicators we often fail to realize just how serious a sin is to complain and to have a negative attitude. <clears throat> if, you, if you turn to Philippians chapter 2, um, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. See, the a complaining spirit, it, it reveals a lack of faith in, in Christ. And it also reveals the lack of our fellowship with God. It's, it's, if, you, if you look into the complaining spirit, actually it is, it is from the flesh. It's more carnal than it is more spiritual. When we become, become complainers, it actually reveals our heart, which is not resting in the power and the provision of our God. See, see the situation among the Israelites. Though they were so rebellious, God provided them with water, with food. He knew the stubbornness of the people and the unbelief of those people. If you read in, in verse 4 of chapter 15 of Exodus, Um, chapter 16, I'm sorry. When they were grumbling about the food, see like how God responds. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. He did not say like he is going to provide. He is not going to give them. He is going to rain them. He is going to give them in abundance. This is the second test God gives them. This is the test of faith and obedience for his people. Several things we need to men, um, uh, I need to mention here about the bread. That bread, whatever God gave, is supernatural. If you if you look into verses eleven to <coughs> excuse me, eleven to fifteen in, in chapter sixteen. It's a supernatural food. They did not do anything to earn that food, the bread. It is not from their own effort. It was provided by God. You remember when sin entered? God said, like, the ground is cursed, and they have to sweat their brow for the bread. They have to till the ground. 
But here, God is providing the bread for them. No need to collect grains, no need to knead, no need to make a dough. Just like that, you come, step out of your home, you see the bread on the ground. If you, if you read in Psalm 78, it is described that it is the bread of angels, manna. That was the thing that they ate for that 40 years when they were in the wilderness till they came into Canaan. And the second point here is they found it was sufficient. Whatever God gave that manna, the supernatural food, it, it served all the purpose for them. But still, people were disobedient. If you, if you read into this chapter, you would know that God told them specifically how much they need to collect, how they need to collect. But again, they started holding up. They could collect only what they needed for each day, and they were not supposed to store anything. But what happened when they stored? It got rotten. What did they do? Disobedient. God gives daily our bread. That's what we read in Matthew 6, 11. Give us this day our daily bread. The point here is God is teaching these people to trust him on a daily basis. Are we doing that? We need not worry or complain about what we will not have for tomorrow or for day after tomorrow. That's what we, most of the people are much worried. What will I do? What will we do when this is going to happen, when that is going to happen? <clears throat> That's not the way. <clears throat> Trust him on a daily basis. And again, <clears throat> the manna, it was a sacred thing. When we read from verses 31 to 36 of chapter 16, what does God command Moses to do? Take a jar and place the manna in it and within the Ark of Covenant. He makes these people remember how God was so faithful in providing the bread for them when they were in big distress. The reason for such a memo memorial is that we are all prone to forget his provision. <clears throat> and it again, like the manna was more a symbolic thing too. God was not simply interested in making sure that they were met by their physical appetites of the people. But he wanted to make those people learn about the spiritual lessons through the gift of manna. He's far more concerned about the condition of their hearts than he's the comfort of their st stomachs. When we, when, we, when we read in Deuteronomy chapter 8, um, verses two to three. I think like we can we can do two to five, but I will read two to three. Uh, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these forty years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep His commandments. In Verse 3, it says, he humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. <clears throat> God uses the wilderness 
situation to teach us that he really is all we need. When when you when you picture wilderness, it is something like a remote place where you will never find your comforts. You barely find your comfort zone there. Everything is stripped off. You are left all alone. You have to, you need to come to a realization who you are and where you stand in life. God uses this wilderness to sift us, to mold us, to shape us through all those painful experiences. He teaches us to depend upon his word. It's not our own understanding, but we need to rely on his word. The question here is, will we trust him during this distressed time or are we going to complain? The third point here is remember. <clears throat> remember what? Remember that God directs our steps. When we read Psalm 32, 8, we read, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. We have to remember that God is always leading our steps. Narrow the pathway though, still he is there. This is the third test. We move from chapter six, 17, 16 to chapter 17 in Exodus, where they are put to test the third time. That's the water from the rock. <clears throat> These Israelite community, they set out from the desert of Sin and they camp at Rephidim. Um, the word Rephidim, <coughs> excuse me, it means a resting place. They move from desert to desert and in, in between that, they are put to test. Here in Rephidim, it's a very dry place, and they find that they, there are no well over there. There is no supply of water. Anywhere in their sight, they do not see any supply of water. If we are to be in that situation, or if I put it in another way, if the Israelites would have looked back from the day they were redeemed or released from Egypt, they saw the disappearance of the Egyptian army in the Red Sea. They were crossing the Red Sea. And then in the wilderness, God gave them water bitter water turned into sweet water. And then how God provided with manna and quail. When they were in Rephidim and when they did not have water, they should have trusted in God by saying, okay, God, they are, he is going to provide water in this dry place. But they did not. You know what happened? their level of disappointment grew and the level of hostility became higher. If you, if you read into the verses in chapter 17, look in verse 2 of 17. 
So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the law to test? See, all this time <clears throat> in chapter 15 and 16, we see like they were grumbling and they were complaining. But now their disappointments were like steamed up and they are trying to have an idea of a revolt and they were totally frustrated on Moses. You realize the situation like how the mob is reacting when they were not able to find water? As I told, like if, if they would have looked back and realized how they were led through all these things and how the providential hand of God was able to provide them with everything. They totally forgot about everything. If you read in the previous chapters, you would read that the army of Israel, the army of Israel, that's how it's written in the Bible. It was led by God, by the angel of God the pillar of cloud during the day and the pillar of fire by night that never left them. God's presence never left those people. But God was not in the hearts of these people. They totally rejected God. They totally rejected Moses. They were putting God into trial. They had a very hardened heart, which was totally, totally ingratitude towards God. Turn to um, Psalms 95, verse 7 to 9. Psalms 95. Verses 7 to 9. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your heart as you did, did at Meribah, as you did what did, as you did that day at Maza in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me. They tried me, though they had seen what I did for 40 years. I was angry with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray, and they have not known my ways. <clears throat> so I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See the way they respond to the disappointment of not having water. It revealed their personal dissatisfaction with God. With quarreling with Moses, they were essentially like putting God on trial. If you, if you look into those passages, they were demanding God to provide them with water. You can almost hear their selfish nature. They were not asking for, for water. They were demanding for water. They did not wait for it. And the next thing, what you notice here is, they were denying that God will protect. If you look into verse 3 of chapter chapter 17 it says like but the people were thirsty for water and they grumbled against Moses they said why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst see like they totally deny God is God will protect them they deny the fact that God is the faithful protector. Uh, 
are they not aware that God is always constantly watching them? The next one, what we see here in, they doubt that God is present or not. How do we know that? Like look into verse 7, chapter 17, 7. And he called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the God saying, is the God among us or not? See, they doubt his presence. They totally came to a conclusion that the God that led them out of Egypt parted the Red Sea and made them walk on dry land and who turned the bitter water into sweet water has left them alone in the wilderness place to die. Some of us are also under the same impression whenever we go through any struggles in our life. We almost come to a conclusion God has abandoned us. <clears throat> this has happened to almost every other person. We cannot deny this fact. In the heat of this thirsty moment, you know what happens? We have a spiritual amnesia kind of thing. We need to stop and think what God has done for us in the past. As I told you, like they were redeemed, crossing of the Red Sea, bitter water sweet, raining of bread, everything forgotten. Everything forgotten. They judge God. They put God into test. They deny his protection. <coughs> Excuse me. The most important thing, what we want to look here is the staff that Moses held in his hand. It almost became a instrument of judgment when it was placed in the hands of God. You remember when he strike, strike the Nile River? It was a divine judgment against Egypt. It was a divine judgment. Why I say this is, look at the Israelite people. They were the unbelieving untrusting, ingratitude people who were on trial. But they were judging God. They were putting God in the witness stand. If he was indeed the one who provides where is the water. If he was indeed their protector, why were they thirsty? If he indeed was ever present, then where was he? When Moses struck the rock, water gushed out. <clears throat> These sinful people needs to be judged. But you know what God did? We'll read that in the verses here. When we read chapter 17, verse 6, I'll, I'll, I'll better read from chap, uh, verses 5. Chapter 17 of Exodus. 
the Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of the Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rod, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Masa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? As I told you, these sinful people deserve to be judged, to be struck for their unbelief. But yet, you know what God told? Strike me instead. God delivers these people by submitting his own rod of judgment, by taking the judgment in Moses' place. So Moses strikes the rod and water gushes out. Before we move further, we'll go back to Psalms 78. I want to share before, as we turn to chapter 78 of Psalm, this is the first time I'm reading Psalm 78, to be very honest with you. And when I read this, it brings a lot of insights. So I, I personally prefer that you people, when you find time, try to read this Psalm 78. It brings the history of what the Israelite people did and how they were judging God. So we'll turn to chapter 78, read verses 15 and 16. <clears throat> He split the rock in the wilderness and gave them water as abundant as the seas. He brought streams out of a rocky crag and made water flow down like rivers. See, in his providence, God directs the step of his people, even to dry places in life, to demonstrate his power and ability. Can we turn to First Corinthians chapter 10, 1 and 4. By reading this, we will finish the study, which I want to emphasize. The main emphasis here, First Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. Look into the words of Paul. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. The rock was Christ. He was struck once for our place, for the sinner's place, so that we could be saved from judgment. That's what we read in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 and 5. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, 
stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. If we are hungry, he is our manna. <clears throat> the manna for our barren soul. That's what we read in John chapter 635. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. So are you hungry? And he's our mana for our barren soul. Are you thirsty? And he's the rock who was struck. The rock who was struck from which came the fountain of flowing water that always suits us. If you, if you read in John 7, 37 and 38, on the last day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. He is our manna that satisfies our hungry soul. And he is the rock that was struck once so the living water could flow that will quench our thirst in the wilderness. Because he died and he rose again, he gives to us freely the Spirit to only those who trust him and yield our lives to him. He is the true bread that came down from heaven. He is the fountain of living water. And if we drink, we will never thirst again. He will put a well of water in us, the Holy Spirit. Do we realize all these things? He has not proven himself to us time again and again. Do we realize that one? Every time, every distress, every painful things, he has provided us. Is there any reason that we want to deny that fact? He has saved us from the sin bondage. He dipped us into those waters and put our feet on solid ground and when he wants to put us through the wilderness to sift us to mold us are we supposed to complain against him or are we want to show him our gratitude grow in deep faith with him indeed he is our bread he satisfies us, and his water, it suits us, and his grace is all what we need, both for our salvation and our growth. Let us not be critical. Let us not be negative. Let us not be unbelieving. As we walk forward in faith, let us always remember let us rec recognize, let us realize, remember that he directs our steps and realize he always provides us. And let us recognize that he tests our faith.
because he is our supreme God. He is our almighty, ever-present, all-knowing God that we serve. Lord God, thank you for your presence, Lord. Thank you for being with us, talking with us. Help us always to remember you in our steps, every moment of our life, till your second coming, Lord. Help us to realize, Lord, that you always provide us. Help us to be satisfied with that. And help us to, Lord, recognize that you always test us and let us always respond in the right way so that we know more about you, have an even deeper, intimate relationship with you, Lord. We need nothing more except for your spiritual food, your bread, and the well of water that springs in us. Lord, you dwell in us. You live in us. You live through us. Let our actions, our attitudes, always bring glory to your name, Lord. Let us always be a shining light. Let us always be those salt, changing flavors in the lives of other people too, Lord. Let that be, be bringing more glory into heaven, Lord. Bring more souls. Win more souls. Thank you for speaking. Thank you for your presence, Lord. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.